Good evening, it's it's Charlie ZL2CTM. Um, I thought I just wanted to do a, a quick video before I have to disappear um, on a, uh, a business trip for a couple of weeks. Um, so I thought I'd just do a quick update. Um, for a start, firstly, apologies for the quality of this audio and the video. Um, my normal camera had a flat battery, which I've been struggling with for a while now, trying to get a decent one for it. So um, I've had to resort to a, a webcam, so... Apologies there for um, the quality of the video and audio. But as you recall in the last video, um, after a, uh, a suggestion, I'm going to look to use a Class E RF amplifier for for our radio here. Um, and doing the reading for the last week, uh, I think that's going to be really good actually um, and quite exciting. Um, I'm going to use as a basis this paper here by Nathan Sokal. Um, in that paper he describes... Uh, the class E amplifier in terms of the schematic like this. So you've got your, your switching device here, uh, a couple of inductors and a couple of capacitors. This inductor L1 here is uh, essentially a, an RFC which you set um, and then as we'll see in a sec um, its value then gets fed into the formulas for working out the two capacitors, the second inductor uh, and our load resistor. In that paper there he presents uh, a number of formulas uh, there's a formula there for our load resistance and then um, a number of formulas there for working out the values of those two capacitors and like I say that second inductor. Um, there are several online tools which have converted these formulas into a, a nice simple calculator online. Um, I elected just to do it by hand uh, just for the sake of it. Um, but have been using those calculators uh, to great to good effect. So, um, for a start, um, I'm going to look to use a, a BS170 device um, for this particular amplifier. Uh, looking at the, uh, for a start, we need to, to work out a few things before we can start using the formulas. But in terms of assumptions and uh, values for that BS170, uh, from the spec sheet, it has a turn-on time of four nanoseconds. Um, it wasn't in Nathan's paper, but I did read one website that suggested that that turn-on time should be less than 30% of the half RF cycle. So if we were to assume that our uh, frequency of operation is going to be 7 megahertz, that gives us a, a period of 143 nanoseconds. So 30% um, of half would be 0.3 times 0.5 times 143 nanoseconds gives us 21 nanoseconds. So that's good. So our 4 nanoseconds is indeed uh, a lot less than uh, 21 nanoseconds. Uh, we'll assume the saturation voltage uh, for that particular device will be 1 volt, which will assign V0, uh, which gets used in the formulas. And from the spec check, our on resistance between the uh, drain and the source uh, is 1.8 ohms. A couple of other assumptions. Uh, for that radio frequency choke, um, it said in the paper that it wasn't crucial on what that should be. So I'm just going to use what I've used in the past, which is 10 turns on an FT37-43. So that equates to 35 microhenries, which we'll use as L1. Um, the online tools um, suggest that a good starting value for uh, our loaded Q is 5. Uh, that particular paper talks about, if I recall, uh, about 1.7 to infinity as the value you can use. Uh, interesting enough, uh, another online um, design tool for classy amplifiers suggested, uh, and I haven't had a chance to prove it yet, um, hopefully when I get back off that trip I will, that if you design for a certain power, um, when you actually solder it up and try it, it always seems to be about sort of 30 odd percent lower than what you thought. Um, and this particular individual does all his designs to 150% of what he actually wants. So I want to get around 5 watts out. So I'm going to multiply that by, uh, we'll increase that by 150%. So I'm going to round that to around 8 watts for, uh, for round numbers. So that's all designed for 8 watts. And as we know, uh, that black power block uh, gives me uh, 12 volts DC. So using those equations directly out of um, Nathan's paper, which I won't go through in depth here, but just plugging in the various values, our VCC, our V0, and our power, 
over here we can see our loaded Q. Uh, we can come out in this particular case for our load resistor of 7.785 ohms. Uh, for C1, that's the capacitance that's in parallel with our device. Uh, again, we can plug in our various values there, frequency of operation. The R that we've now calculated from there now gets used uh, in the, uh, the next lot of equations. And we can apply that out and we can get a value of 620 uh, picofarads. Now it does say um, elsewhere that um, you do need to take into consideration the capacitance, the output capacitance of your device. So I'm going to assume that to be around um, 17 picofarads. Um, I do note, and you'll see it later on, I'm going to have uh, a number of devices in parallel, so probably by rights um, that should be increased, but for now um, I'm just going to stick with 17 odd picofarads and see how we go. So 620 minus 17 gives us roughly uh, 603 picofarads. For C2, that's now that um, series resonant um, portion here. Again, plugging in the values gives us a value of 782 uh, picofarads. And then finally L2, that second, that's right, just out of the picture there, that second inductor. Again, plugging in the values gives us 885 nanoherons or 0.885 microhenries. So um, what I think I'm going to do just for playing around and um, sort of tuning this up, uh, there's those particular capacitor values are not standard values. So what I think I'll do, I'll um, look to use a fixed capacitor in parallel with these variable ones here. So we'll use one for both um, C1 and C2, and um, we'll see what we can't get by way of, of, of tuning it up. Um, now for L2, that second inductor, um, I'm going to use a, a T37-6. Um, that's good for 3 to 40 megahertz. Um, so to get our value of uh, 885 uh, nanohenries works out to be uh, 17 turns. So we'll use 17 turns on that uh, to give that value there. Um, if that's too tight, um, then I'll look to go up a value to probably this one here. I mean, go up to that size there, which is the next size up, uh, T50-6. So see how we get on there. Um, now... We will we'll need a, uh, an output transformer, so this is the configuration of what we will try. Uh, we need to transform our 50 ohms back to uh, 7.785 ohms that we worked out in our equations. Um, so we'll need to have a transformer there. Looking to get roughly 5 watts, so I'm pretty happy to get away with a, um, a BN43-302. Um, I think that will probably be okay for us. Um, so again, just using our standard formula, um, our lower impedance times n squared gives us 50, that's what we want to transform, which gives us an n of 2.534, uh, which is roughly 5 divided by 2. So 5 divided by 2 is close enough to 2.534. And again, just doing our quick our check uh, to make sure that the smallest winding, which is the two-turn winding, that its inductive reactance at the lowest frequency is at least four times or four to five times um, the impedance that it's seeing. So we plug it in, two turns on a BN43-302 works out to be 5.12 microhenries. We know our inductive reactance is, is 2 pi FL, so we can just plug it in two times pi times seven megs, our lowest frequency times that inductance gives us 225 ohms, which is good. Indeed, that is greater than four times 7.785. And apologies there for the focus running in and out there. Um, I really don't know how to fix that. But once we get back to the other camera, we should be fine. So like I say, hopefully that's nicely in focus there. Um, that's the circuit uh, we will try uh, when I get back off that trip. The good thing is our BS170 is turned up. So I've got 100 of those, so that should keep us going for uh, quite some time. Um, our peak current that we'll be seeing through here is going to be roughly uh, 0.7 to 0.8 uh, amps. 
Um, so I think having three of those in parallel uh, should be fine. They're good for about half a watt dissipation, if I recall. Um, and they're only on for a very short period of time anyway, so uh, I'm pretty happy that we should be able to, through using three devices in parallel, uh, cope with that current. Um, so probably nothing else to say there, and that's that circuit up there we saw in the previous video is just our key shaping circuit, uh, that integrator. Uh, so we'll give that a go as well. So that's what we'll look to um, look to play around with when I get back off that business trip. And like I say, this capacitor here will be a variable one, and that one will be a variable one. And we'll see how we get on uh, with those two um, variable capacitors. So what I did do, um, for interest sake, hopefully this will come out right, okay, is I, I hope that's not hunting too much in terms of the focus. Doesn't look too bad. Um, on the right hand side here uh, is that particular circuit um, simulated in LT SPICE. Um, our various values there and we can see down here our output waveform. The red one there is the, the current um, coming out of the device. So if I was to double click on that we can get back to our, our, um, our voltage across that particular device there. It's up to uh, 12 volts and down to about minus 10. So if we do the do the maths, that works around to be uh, 7.785. Um, what did I say? 7.8, I think it is. Uh, 7.8 watts. Um, so that's uh, that's probably about right. Um, so we'll play around with that one. On the left hand side of interest uh, is the Class E amplifier that was used in the QRP Labs um, little CW transmitter. It's, it's a class E amplifier, but it's, it's taken a, a slightly different approach. So what he did there, he took this inductor here, and through the online calculator, he worked out what's the turns ratio needed to present at 7 megahertz a 50, uh, 50 ohms inductive reactance. It turns out to be 1.14 microhenries, and then... The, uh, that online calculator, uh, which is this one here, if I can just bring that one up, uh, which is Torgoids Info, which is a really good one. If I was to go down to the, uh, the T30-5, or whatever it is down here, you can basically plug in your frequency of operation, um, how many ohms you want, and go calculate, and it'll give you what the turns needs to be as well as what the parallel capacitor will need to be. Uh, so that's of interest, and that's what he, he essentially used in this, um, what I can gather, in his circuit here. So now, the value of 440, 455 picofarads um, is what that online calculator spat out as being the capacitance needed to be in parallel with that um, to at 50 ohms, to say again, at 7 megahertz, uh, present a 50 ohm load to then match to a 50 ohm load over here. So quite different. Um, from what I can gather here, it's only the two components running through a, um, a DC isolation and then into a, uh, a, a very basic, and I just threw this one in here as a very basic uh, low pass filter, then into our 50 ohm load. And then just looking at um, its waveform. So we double click on that, we can bring this up. And again, if we do the maths here, so that's going up to plus 22 volts down to around minus 18. Um, so take half of that, 0.7071 squared divided by 50 ohms, works out to be about 4.5 watts. Um, and in his documentation, this was designed to be a, a 5 watt uh, transmitter. So interesting approach. Um, I'm going to run with uh, Nathan's approach for a start, have a bit of a play around with that. And then if time is, uh, or time allows, then I may look to um, have a bit of a play around with the approach taken by uh, QRP Labs. But interesting enough, sort of um, a different approach, but both Class E amplifiers. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention was um, the use of this um, CW filter. Um, it's been suggested that, and I, and I, and I do actually realise that, uh, if you were to try and purchase one of those, it's horribly expensive. It's around 113 odd uh, American dollars. 
So what I, what I am going to do, I'm going to do another video on uh, building a, a homebrew crystal filter. Um, I won't do it using the same approach as I did in a previous video, which was just using just straight rule of thumb um, values. Um, I'm going to use this approach here by Wes Hayward um, in this particular document here, which goes back to 1987 in QST. Um, it's, it's, it's something which I quite like. So um, essentially we'll be using a little SDR receiver here to uh, to, to basically look at um, getting at least three, if not four, crystals um, within 50 hertz of each other. Um, and then we'll look to use the approach that's presented in this one here to build a, a little um, crystal filter. So he presents here both um, CW and SSB, and it's very similar to what I've done in the past. So once you have those um, those crystals identified within 50 hertz, then they really are just sort of set values capacitors um, to then work out uh, in your in your your load impedance to get your various wave uh, your your pass band. So I need to have another close look at this, but um, the plan is I've, I've got a whole carton of crystals turning up in the mail shortly. Um, they have a large can size, which is good. And like I say, we'll look to um, to do another video on making up a crystal filter using the approach presented uh, in this particular paper here. So anyway, that's enough. Um, I'll say 73s here. And uh, like I say, I'll be away for a couple of weeks. But when I get back, uh, the plan is to to crack into making up that that test circuit there. We've got our devices now, um, and uh, we'll just see um, how it performs. Anyway, 73 is all, and um, if I don't catch you shortly, I'll see you when I get back. Okay, cheers.